So, and this is joint work with uh, my co-authors, Bobak Shahriari and Nando DeFridis. Um, okay, so the thing that we're really interested in is solving black box optimization tasks. And so what I really mean by that is we just have some function f that we're trying to optimize, but really the inner workings of f are unknown, and we can only uh, get access to f by querying it at specific locations x. And out, the outputs we're going to get are corrupted by some sort of noise. Um, so one typical uh, sort of modern application of this is A-B testing. And really, this is just sort of a new name for an old idea. But um, it's used a lot by, by Google and various other companies to sort of modify how they tailor their websites to their customers. And basically, it is you take a small subset of your customers, and you show them uh, different variations on your parameters. Like you might vary the words you give them, or the colors, or these fonts. And then you're going to look at the, uh, the, the actual outputs um, that are of the form, you know, click-through rates, or, or whether they actually uh, purchase your products. So that, that purchasing information corresponds exactly to the F in the black box setting, and the X's are the, these different parameters that we're varying. Okay. Um, another sort of application that we're going to focus on in this work is uh, black box optimization of, of functions. So in particular, we're going to address the problem of finding the maximizer of some nonlinear black box function, at a, and we're going to look at a finite number of points. So here, I've illustrated, uh, using this dashed line, the, the function that I'm trying to optimize. And I'm going to look specifically at some collection of, of finite points that I've denoted with dots here. And then the red x's are my actual noisy function evaluations that, that I get from these points. Um, OK, and to properly do so, we really want to take into account the correlation between these different points. So in this example, uh, we have sort of this, this smoothness of this function. Um, but it need not necessarily be smoothness. Um, and we're interested in particular in finding the global maximum. So we want to find the best of these possible points. And we're going to take advantage of the fact that we often have a limited query budget, and we know this query budget. So we know that we want to run this for 100 iterations, and at the end of those 100 iterations, we want to give a single answer. Okay. So our contributions in this work are to combine all three of these previous criteria, and this really can lead to better performance when all of these things matter. And we're going to give a comprehensive comparison of many uh, bandit algorithms and best arm algorithms and, and more classical Bayesian optimization algorithms for these problems. So Bayesian uh, uh, bandits for optimization. I'm going to give a general formulation of, of the problem we're going to tackle. Um, and so as, as I said earlier, we're going to uh, consider a finite set of query locations x. And we're going to iteratively uh, query um, this underlying function, our, our black box. And so at every time t, we're going to pick an xt, um, some xt from our set, and observe the corresponding y that we get from the black box. We'll iterate this for uh, t iterations, and then at the end of time t, we have to make a single recommendation, just a single recommendation that I'm going to call omega t. And now, each location uh, that we're interested in, each of our x's, is associated with, with some mean. Um, mu k, and really this mu k is the, uh, the latent function that I'm interested in optimizing. So I want to find the x that corresponds to the highest mean mu k here. Um, and so our goal is to define a strategy for selecting our, our sequence of points and then recommending our omega such that with high probability this omega is optimal. So what, what I mean here is that we really want to optimize the probability that uh, this omega is actually the, the true x star, the true maximizer. Um, so uh, what, what we're going to do in particular is we're going to assume some uh, parameterized model with unknown theta. And then uh, this is just sort of standard, given some prior over theta uh, over these parameters. Then after our t queries, we can compute our posterior over the parameters theta. 
And then this induces a posterior over our means. And it's really this posterior over the means that we're interested in talking about. This is the thing that we're going to use to um, drive our exploration because it's really the means that are the things that we're interested in, in um, optimizing. And so for linear Gaussian models, like we'll uh, uh, consider in, in this paper, um, this is all textbook, closed form. But for the finite number of points we're interested in, this also includes uh, Gaussian process models, because we can sort of do the reverse of, of the kernel trick and uh, take a kernel and transform it back into uh, features. Um, because often, uh, for like the smoothness constraints, I, uh, for the functions I talked about earlier, it's often easier to specify these things in terms of, of a kernel function. Okay, so now that I've introduced that, we can talk about, okay, finding the best query point. So, so what do we actually do to find this query point? Okay, so this is sort of the, the general principle for the, the uh, approach of best arm identification. And uh, here I've defined this, this delta k term up here, where delta k is uh, sort of a, a measure of the optimality or suboptimality of each of the query locations I'm interested in. So this is the definition of delta k, but for, for a, a three-point problem, I've sort of illustrated this here. So these are my, these three points represent my, my latent function value that I'm interested in optimizing, and the vertical lines here represent the delta k. So for the best arm or the best query location, this is the uh, difference between that latent function value and the second best latent function value. And then for all other points, it's just the, the difference between their value and the value of, of the best point, okay? So now we're going to consider that we have uh, LK and UK, and, and these are going to be for each iteration, we'll be able to compute these, um, and I'll, I'll detail how to do that uh, later. But these are just upper and lower sort of confidence bounds on uh, where I, I think my, um, uh, my means are. And I'm going to assume that my means are, are within these ranges. So later in the paper, we'll, or if you come talk to us at the poster, we're actually going to deal with this. We'll, we'll give uh, uh, high probability bounds uh, in order to derive these. So it will be with high probability that we're in these ranges. But just for right now, we'll assume that our, our means are somewhere within these bands. Um, so now, if so here actually on this previous section here, these, these bounds are sort of overlapping. So I can't, I know that my means are within here somewhere, but because they're overlapping, I can't really say anything about whether I've found the best query point or not. Because for example, I could have mu1 here and mu2 here, I can't really say anything. But if I am able to reduce the uncertainty um, to delta k over 2, then essentially what I will have is that the bound for the best arm will be above the, uh, the upper bound for all other arms, so I will have definitely found, you know, with high probability, uh, the, uh, the location of the best arm. So this general uh, method is, is sort of how we go about uh, defining these sorts of approaches. And if I can devise a method that uh, can reduce my uh, confidence bounds in, in such a way, then that's sort of the, the task I've set for myself. Okay, so here's sort of really general pseudocode for uh, this approach. Um, and I've sort of alluded to this earlier, but I start out with a prior over my means. And then for iterations one through t, I'm going to select a point uh, observe the, the noise-corrupted value at that point, or a noise-corrupted value at that point, and update my posterior. And I'm going to do that for capital T iterations, and then at the end, I'm going to return some, uh, some recommendation. And these are really the two important steps. I have this sort of exploration step here and a recommendation step once I get to the end. So, and I haven't detailed how those are going to come about, and, and now I'll, I'll, I'll describe what, what we, we did in this paper. Um, and so we define this uh, gap quantity, which is for every uh, point k, it's the lower bound for that point subtracted from the, uh, the upper bound of the next best point. 
Okay? And now this essentially sort of roughly gives us a, a, a bound on the, the, the suboptimality of each of our different arms. And I, I won't go into that in too much more detail, and if you're interested, you know, come talk to us at the poster. But um, this allows us to define some candidate locations. So at every iteration, we, we compute this B and then define two candidate locations. Capital J is just the minimizer over this B for uh, all of our different query locations. And little j is the maximum of the upper bound for, other, for things other than capital J. So it's essentially the best alternative. And then our exploration strategy is just to consider these two candidate points at every iteration and select the point that corresponds to the highest posterior uncertainty. Um, and, and that's how we go about that. And then we do that for T iterations. And our recommendation strategy is then going to be, one, the, the point that had the smallest B sort of historically uh, over our capital T iterations. This last point is sort of, uh, it's kind of a convoluted strategy. And it's really there to sort of make the theory work. But we also experimented with just using the maximum posterior mean. And that has about the same performance. Um, and and the, uh, related is this work uh, in, in sort of a more frequentist setting, the work of Gabion in uh, 2012. So, okay, so really the important thing is how we define these bounds. Sort of the, the definition of the algorithm is, is the, the, the previous slide sort of gave the framework for it, but really the details come to, how, as with many banded algorithms, how you define these sorts of bounds. For the uh, linear Gaussian models that I talked about earlier, it's, it's, or we use very simple bounds, uh, which are just the, the posterior mean plus the posterior standard deviation multiplied by some beta term here. And I, I definitely can't get into the details of how this beta term is derived. I'll give the expression for it uh, on the next slide. But at, at a very rough level, we select this beta in order to maximize the probability that within our time horizon, we're able to uh, uh, collapse the confidence de intervals down into this uh, specific range, the, the delta k over 2. Um, OK, so if we use, for example, this particular beta, uh, and which, which takes into account the, uh, the, the time horizon, the, uh, the lengths of our x's, et cetera, um, then we can get the probability that we have of being optimal is, is this quantity right here, uh, this 1 minus kt e to the negative beta squared. So, and, uh, so this uh, essentially gives us uh, a nice decreasing uh, probability that we're going to actually make an error. Um, however, so, so this gives us some, some theory about uh, how well we're able to perform. But also, um, this sort of strangely is, is very crucial to deriving the algorithm as well. So in order to come up with this beta, we sort of have to solve for, for uh, create this theorem, and then find the beta that satisfies that. And again, for more detail, come talk to us at the poster. But OK, so we have these bounds. So now the question is, how well does it perform in practice? So uh, one task that, that we tried this out on was uh, an optimization task in, in sensor networks. And this comes from some earlier work of uh, Krause in, I believe it was 2010. OK, so we basically have a, uh, a number of uh, speed sensors, traffic speed sensors, on uh, Highway I-880 South in California. OK, and so we have uh, 357 sensors. These are going to correspond to the, the query points that we're interested in. And uh, in these experiments, we're going to allow ourselves a, a horizon of 400. So we're, we're going to look for 400 points. And in particular, to get error bars, we'll, we, we redid this 840 times. And I'll show the results on the next slide. But um, our goal is then to identify the single location with the highest expected speed, um, or the, the least uh, congested area of, of, this, um, of this highway. Um, so here are some results. And we compare against a, a number of different algorithms. 
um, what I'm showing here is the, the probability that we make an error. So the probability that we recommend a point that is actually not the, the least congested point. And the, uh, um, so, so the, the methods, the two methods that we show on the left here are um, some uh, best arm identification methods. And they're actually really good algorithms, but they assume that uh, we have um, uh, independence between the different query locations. So in this task, we, they're, they're definitely not independent. There's correlation between the different locations in the uh, traffic network. And so these are not able to perform nearly as well within the uh, uh, allotted time horizon. Um, and then the, the third one here is, is a, a Bayesian bandit method, which is not necessarily performing best arm identification, but it is uh, able to use the correlation. So it, is, it, it knows about the correlation, so it, it definitely performs better. These uh, four on the right are, um, uh, well, actually, the, the three right here, expected improvement, probability of improvement, and GPUCB, are now sort of standard Bayesian optimization techniques um, that perform relatively well. And Thompson is, is here, Thompson sampling, otherwise known as probability matching, which is a, a really uh, interesting um, randomized method for selecting between these points. And then the uh, point that we have right here in the middle is, is our method. And, and among these different algorithms, we achieve the, uh, the lowest probability of making an error. Um, and one thing I, I'll point out before I go on to the next results is to notice the uh, difference we have between our method and Thompson sampling. So uh, the next thing we looked at is a task of automatic machine learning. So we wanted to take uh, a number of methods for regression and select between them. To, so select the different method that we're going to apply to some data set. Um, in particular, we used implementations from scikit-learn, um, and we used 160 different models. Um, we only allowed 40 different queries. Um, so, and each query corresponds to a specific uh, cross-validation fold with, it, with one of these models. So we, we pick a particular training and test set, uh, we uh, run that and, and look at the results, and then we move on and then we'll try some other ones. So, and again, we're, we used uh, 100 independent trials to show the error bars that I'll show on the next slide. And these models include ridge regression, lasso, uh, linear and RBF SVMs, uh, k-nearest neighbors, and random forests. And we used a, a number of different hyperparameters within each model. And the key thing to point out is that given the number of models and the number of queries, uh, we cannot afford to try all models in all cross-validation sets, tests. Um, and we cannot even um, uh, look at most of the, um, the folds for a large proportion of the, num of, of, of the samples. However, this allows us to look at a few samples, and uh, especially because we, we consider some correlation between the different models, we can quickly sort of focus our attention on the models that seem to be performing the best. Um, and uh, here we, ha we have our performance on, uh, on, uh, on, this on, on this problem. Again, we have EI, PI, and GPUCB. The other methods we, we couldn't uh, apply to this problem because we, we didn't even have the, uh, the number of samples we were drawing was less than the number of models we had. And uh, approaches which assume independence between the different models uh, require at least to sample everything once. However, this is why I pointed out to look at uh, Thompson on the previous slide. We perform the best here. Thompson performs about as well as us. Maybe there are a few more outliers. But um, we are still among the best, uh, whereas Thompson in the previous experiment was, uh, was definitely performing poorer uh, than our method. So, so it seems like it may be more stable across different uh, problems. And I just wanted to give a, a brief illustration of, of the actual process that's going on. These are uh, the, uh, across the, this axis here, we have the different models we're looking at. The, uh, the time, basically, uh, is going into the screen here. So this is as we run more and more tests. And uh, along the, uh, and each bar represents uh, a single pole of, of, of the model. 
And then along the back wall, we show the, uh, the actual recommendation and how often we recommended it over a number of different runs. So uh, here's my conclusions, which I've, I've already sort of stated to you. We combine a, a number of, of different techniques from best arm techniques, use of correlation, and use of known bounded horizon. And we uh, tried this on a variety of Bayesian optimization, or we compared to a variety of Bayesian optimization and bandit techniques and applied it to some interesting black box problems and uh, automating some uh, frequent machine learning tasks. And uh, thank you for your attention. Hi. Uh, so I have a question about the objective function you're using. Yeah. Um, so you're trying to maximize the probability that you pick the best arm, right? Yeah. The optimal arm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it seems like you, can, you could construct cases where um, you have two alternatives, one arm that um, is never optimal, but it's epsilon optimal. Uh, so, so we do and actually, uh, we actually in the paper we consider epsilon optimal, but I didn't here. I didn't want to really discuss that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so I guess I'm just saying um, it seems like the objective criterion is um, a little bit brittle, right? Because you might, you know, go with an alternative that's very likely to be optimal, um, but uh, doesn't actually produce the, the recommendation with highest expected value. So I'm wondering how how do, how do your results change when um, uh, so, so actually, I, I should state that in the in the results here, thi so this result was with with the the probability of error. Um, so essentially, the the, the method that, that I discussed. This is using uh, these methods, but this is this is essentially just the 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 uh, root mean squared error of of the predictors that we looked at. So this is essentially just the the output um, comparing the output of the different methods. Um, so, and it, it still performs relatively well. Um, yeah. So, and, and I, I, we, we, we're going to, we're running more experiments and looking at more things like this, but it seems to, it still seems to work pretty well if uh, we, we look at those, just not just the probability of error. And this allows us to make guarantees, for example, that, that we do find the optimum. 